Excellent. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and yeah, I'm David Power. I head up the uh, television and HPC division at Skater, and I'm primarily responsible for integrating a lot of our HPC technologies on top of this uh, cloud platform. Um, but before I get started today, I just wanted to get to know my audience a little better so I can address you correctly. So could I have a, perhaps a show of hands for your consumers, say, or users of HPC technology? Have we any of those people in the audience? Have a few. Um, have we any administrators of these HPC systems who look after the, the back end and provide service for users? Again, a couple. Very good. Um, and how about people that have been provisioning cloud-based services or utilizing technologies like OpenStack? Have any of uh, those characters in the room? Okay, excellent. And how about uh, people that are against audience participation? <laughs> okay, kind of good. Um, so uh, vScaler is... Um, Primarily, it's an OpenStack distribution. Um, so if you go onto the, the OpenStack marketplace, you'll kind of see it between Red Hat and Canonical in terms of a validated OpenStack distribution. But we've kind of taken a slightly different approach towards OpenStack than some of the other providers. So we focus primarily on provisioning research infrastructure and facilitating research infrastructure on top of our OpenStack distribution. So we've spent a lot of time optimizing for performance under the, under the OpenStack layer and ensuring that we're getting as close to Experimental performance as we possibly can, and then on top of the product, we're also layering environments that make it easier for researchers to spin up customized environments for their own particular research and bring their own applications to uh, to our environment as well. So it's a uh, it's a distribution, but we operate as a public cloud and it's consumable as a private cloud as well. And we've also built an integration between those two layers as well to allow kind of a transparent migration of applications between public and private also. Um, we're also proud to be one of the first OpenStack public clouds in Ireland. So we've been working with the uh, guys down in the Corp Internet Exchange. Um, I suspect my graphic is sufficiently small that none of you can actually see or read that. But yeah, CIX down in Corp, Jerry and his team were very um, helpful in terms of facilitating us getting our public offering up and running in Ireland. We've also got additional facilities and data centers in London, and we're bringing on um, data centers in Germany as well at the moment. So we're kind of expanding out through Europe. Um, so, taking a step back, um, what is OpenStack? So, I mean, OpenStack, and I've taken this definition from the, um, the OpenStack uh, market, uh, the OpenStack website itself. So, it's essentially a, a cloud operating system that allows us to manage and control pools of storage, networking, and compute through a sort of a managed dashboard or CLI and provision them in a kind of a fairly easy way to do so. So, ultimately, it's, it's an infrastructure as a service software, it's open sourced. Anyone can go and take it, compile it, build it, and use it, and it provides you with similar capabilities to what you find with um, AWS or Azure or any of these other commercial clouds that are out there and available as well. So it's uh, ultimately a cloud operating system. Um, to give a small bit of background on why businesses and organizations are considering OpenStack or driving business use towards OpenStack, and I've taken this from the OpenStack survey, which was um, conducted last year, um, and again, you can kind of I've nicely deleted all the colours to make it look pretty, but hopefully it can kind of make a, a little bit of sense. We've got the darker going from the lighter in terms of the priority. So despite the um, incline in the um, graph here, you know, the, the cost is one of the primary choices for kind of utilising these open source technologies. Standardising on an open platform and not being you know, tied in with some sort of a proprietary um, uh, cloud provider is another huge driver and avoiding vendor locking. So the ability to take and lift from cloud to cloud or open stack provider to open stack provider is one of the very um, top considerations when considering this. Um, some users that we've spoken to who have been leveraging some public clouds, and I think it was discussed in brief earlier as well, they sort of observed that it's very cost effective to begin and start trialing and prototyping. But once you start to ramp up on a public cloud, the costs can escalate quite rapidly. In particular, when you start moving and um, taking out large volumes of data as well, there's, there's hidden costs associated with that. Um, there's also other additional um, abilities within here as well, but, you know, the pace of innovation and deploying applications faster are all kind of key considerations when selecting a, a cloud platform um, for yourself. Now, that's great and everything, but there's also considerable challenges with OpenStack. So it's as I find it, it's the mother of all learning curves, and I've worked in HPC for uh, a long time, and I was a programmer at MPI, and I was a researcher in artificial intelligence, and this has given me the bags under my eyes and the grey hairs inside my head. 
It's, um, it, can, it brings together every technology that you'll ever want to use in a data center um, as separately consumable projects and allows you to potentially integrate them into one. So you need to get your own software-defined networking, <laughs> software-defined infrastructure, computing, storage, bring all of those together and then layer HPC capabilities in on top of it. So it's, a, it, it's not an easy thing for perhaps smaller organizations, research institutes to go and take on. Um, what we've seen over the last number of years has been you know, some of the very large telcos and research, uh, research organizations who have big teams of uh, engineers at their disposal who've gone on and taken this um, OpenSec product on in, 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 in anger. Um, and, and one of the challenges, of course, is that there's a shortage in skills um, around deploying this. So it's difficult, um, but it's becoming easier. And that, that's kind of one of the pain points that we try and address with these scanners by providing something that's very, very easy to, to roll out in existing HPC environments. So um, just taking another step back and kind of look at um, you know, scientific computing on the cloud. I think there's a lot of people talking about its, you know, the, 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 the potential of, of doing this. Um, but we need to kind of take a look back and kind of say, oh, what does HPC actually mean? What is scientific computing today? So, I mean, when I started out in HPC, it was very much a, a scientific, theoretical physics, bioinformatics, computational chemistry. They were the power users of HPC, the traditional users of it. And I think if you look at what end users are demanding from HPC providers today, it's a much broader um, ecosystem. We've got people coming with applications and frameworks from all walks of life that we're expecting to be able to shoehorn into traditional HPC infrastructure. So the rate of change is demanding lots of flexibility and agility, and these aren't traditionally traits within the HPC domain. So being able to kind of take and integrate new emerging frameworks, languages, technologies, that can be a laborious project or, um, process for existing HPC centers to integrate with schedulers and modules and environments to get them all built up and provided to users. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's a constantly evolving term in HPC and the, the, the use cases that are being applied on top of HPC are, are constantly evolving as well. Um, so I've kind of briefly mentioned and talked about this. So again, the, the traditional HPC user is a, you know, a command line Linux guy that works with a batch scheduler, submits an NPI job and then consumes his uh, output after that. But um, over the last number of years, we've kind of observed people <coughs> migrating applications towards you know, containers. We've got deep learning frameworks that are now starting to become very, very popular in HPC. Uh, complex pipelines, Kubernetes, big data, rapid prototyping. I mean, that's just a tiny sampling of what we see. The list is constantly evolving. And even in the, kind of the commercial and industry space, I mean, we have people running everything from rendering to broadcasting to natural language processing on top of our platform traditionally have been considered scientific users, but they're using the same underlying hardware um, and, and consuming the same cloud platform that we actually have today as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's changed a lot, it's becoming a lot more diverse, and that's putting challenges on HPC providers to ensure that they've all the correct tools for researchers to go and conduct their research in an appropriate manner. Okay, so traditionally cloud is not the same as HPC. I wanted to try and kind of address how these two areas are, are converging. So HPC is traditionally about massive scale and about having very fast storage, networking and compute and making them all work together as, uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, one of the, the, the great um, quotes I remember someone saying to me is that HPC is really just about moving bottlenecks around an architecture and trying to keep on moving them around the place. Um, and OpenStack can support a lot of these today, and the community is actually developing quite rapidly in terms of enhancing these features. So the idea here is that uh, alongside or instead of a HPC system, you are able to provide a kind of a self-service research portal to end users that in, instead of you being just a, a team of administrators that respond to constant requests for additional application, upgrades and versions, new libraries, provide an infrastructure that allows your researchers to bring whatever application, be it a containerized Docker application or something written around TensorFlow, let them come and provision the resources that they require on demand and you can focus on you know, enabling users, maintaining a service and not have to spend your entire day just kind of building and compiling new applications as new users come on board. So you know, the, the benefits of Cloud are that it gives you this dynamic and automated means of provisioning services for researchers. 
And I, I think as we kind of look at um, how performance is being enhanced in virtualized environments, um, and how more and more providers are putting in HPC hardware behind cloud infrastructure, that's starting to kind of blur the lines between where cloud and HPC can actually be run. <laughs> so the big question I always get when I'm promoting kind of cloud technologies to, to scientific users is, well, if it's running in a virtualized environment, the performance is going to be crap. Um, and HPC, it, it's all about ensuring that you're running at the highest performance, the highest levels of efficiency within your application. So virtualization is an all for me. We also get questions around, what if I have some inconsiderate user sitting alongside me in my cloud consuming all of the cycles? How can we kind of limit um, that sort of an impact? Software-defined networking. So InfiniBand is a very common network used in, in HPC. And for you know, uh, MPI type applications, you need low latency access into your network, high bandwidth to ensure that if you're running a, a lockstep MPI type application, you don't have one um, core which is holding up the entire uh, application runtime. Um, and then IO challenges. So there, I mean, there are challenges in HPC as well. There's plenty of metadata uh, operation peer applications out there which will grind a lustre file system to its knees. Um, and how can we balance I.O. in the cloud as well? So again, it's about you know, moving this bottleneck around and trying to just, I guess, try and keep everybody equally unhappy is the ultimate goal of providing a, an HMC resource. So we've, we've actually spent quite a lot of time um, looking at how we can you know, ensure that the performance within a virtualized environment is as close to bare metal as it possibly can. Um, and and the, the idea here is that if we can get it close enough to what bare metal is providing, the percentage decrease is offset by the, the flexibility and agility that this service can actually provide. And it's the same as what you see with, if you just take a standard Linux system, people use LVM now as standard as part of the, you know, the deployment of your file system. And that's slower than formatting on a bare metal disk, but everybody's using it because it, you know, it gives you that bit more flexibility and performance that isn't perhaps that, that too considered. So, I mean, a lot of these, um, uh, or, uh, Practices in terms of virtualization are fairly well documented. So you can kind of pin cores, make sure that your memory is, um, you're doing new malware scheduling, back guess memory with new pages, pass through specific models of CPUs for your, to your hypervisor so that ABX and SSE instruction sets are actually aware within your system. I mean, we've done kind of impact tests um, on this, this is kind of measurement of how fast a supercomputing system is or a measurement of the, the floating point operations per second that can be achieved. We're getting to kind of 98, 99% of bare metal performance within our VMs um, with all of these um, uh, tweaks enabled within the system. Um, now the downside as well is once we start to you know, exploit uh, parameters within the hypervisor to the VM, that makes it uh, less agile or we kind of we limit the live migration capabilities within that VM. But if you consider this use case as a kind of a cluster use case and scientific use case. It's um, live migrations and something that we've been used to in terms of HPC anyway, so it's not something that's very high up on our end users' priority list at the moment. But if you're running a critical service for your business or organization, live migration is of course critical. You can turn off a lot of these capabilities to ensure that you have that capability um, at the expense of course of some performance percentage. In terms of the networking as well, so MPI is more very commonly used within HPC, and if you start to layer software-defined networking on top of it, your latency shoots up through the roof, and you experience huge amounts of jitter, which is terrible for large-scale uh, DI applications. So again, we're able to do, um, we, we typically employ um, hardware with support for IO virtualization, or SOIOB, and that allows us direct access into the uh, network cards to ensure that we keep the the latency down and the bandwidth high, and also use some locality where MPI uh, implementations that um, again support using the shared memory space as opposed to going across the network um, in, in terms of here. So again, with all of these capabilities enabled in terms of optimizing the, the network for performance, we're able to get between sort of 91 to 99 percent of what we see when we're kind of measuring based on typical MPI type applications. Um, and again, some of the other challenges around this are when we do SRIOB. We're actually bypassing security groups within OpenStack. Um, and again, that's not too much of a problem within HPC, but when you start to run sensitive or secure services alongside it on the same fabric, that could be um, uh, a consideration for, for certain customers. But within HPC, typically the 
Inibam fabric is publicly available to all users and researchers that are on there, so it's not that distant a departure from what people are doing already today. We've also got challenges around the XLAN support, so that can limit the uh, scalability we have in terms of the customers. Um, and of course, with live migration, then um, you're, you're stuck with only being able to move um, between systems that are virtually identical. Um, the next stage then is how do we ensure that the, the, the performance of your data is you know, consistent with what you're used to seeing in, in HPC environments. So there's different kind of consumption models here. If you look at um, the way data is accessed in HPC, it's a, it's a large parallel file system, typically Luster or GPFS or something like that, that all users have equal access to. And if you go to a cloud, um, you're going to be provided with a block or object type use case. So there's a, a mismatch there. The, the sharing model, so with HPC, there's often many clients or, or MPI processes accessing the same file, um, and in cloud, everything is kind of discrete and sectioned away on a per user or per tenant basis. Um, and then, then in terms of the persistence, so within HPC, it's very much a, a cost performance balance that's um, you know, a, a try to achieve. Um, so we sacrifice redundancy for performance, um, and then in cloud, you just replicate everything, which of course can have a impacts on performance as well. So there's, a, there's an opportunity here as well to, to rethink the way storage is provided to, um, for, for research computing. So cloud offers some great capabilities in terms of the, the automated provisioning, multi-tenancy, collaboration, and even in terms of data isolation for secure projects that are running inside in the HPC centers. And then on the technology side, there's also some very interesting new technologies that are coming to market that allow us to you know, accelerate and provide alternative consumption models within HPC, and that ranges from you know, 3D cross points, um, online searchable archives, and wider adoption of objects as well. So um, one of the approaches we've made in terms of providing the, the storage is to actually try and provision storage based on um, uh, per user, per project, or per application requirements. So we can actually provision IOPS, and provision bandwidth, and provision um, performance directly to end users or directly to particular applications or projects so that they're limited in terms of the amount of consumption they have. We don't get into this situation where somebody runs a, a big you know, find or recursive LS across a file system and that grinds everything to a halt. If we say user X can only have a couple of thousand IOPS, that is provisioned to that direct end user and they're not able to go above that limit that restricts then the amount of overhead that's on our backend file system. So we use an all-flash file system to provision this storage, and then we also integrate that with a larger online object archive on which scientists can then push data from the hot tier, as it were. And this can be done through HSM, it can be done automatically, or we can kind of, you know, the data is not touched in five or six months. We fire that out onto an object uh, server, but we can layer POSIX file systems on top of it, and even Elasticsearch on top of it. So instead of it going off to something like tape, we always have this information at hand for researchers if they want to go back and include old data, old information within their sort of research or go back and kind of see what happened if we apply those old data sets to, to new optimizations within our algorithms as well. So yeah, we can layer on uh, kind of an uh, elastic search on top of objects, search queries that come back from that object can then be exported again as NFS back into our cluster, or we can kind of take the data as hot and it automatically moves up to our uh, all flash here as well for, um, for faster uh, access within our storage. Um, so again, getting the storage right, so it, it, yeah, it really is about, as I said, keeping everybody equally unhappy, making sure that nobody is able to bring down or overuse any of the uh, storage within their uh, platform. So keeping everything isolated and ensuring that all of the storage is policy driven is a, is a key factor to um, people keeping people happy within our, our cloud system. Um, the other thing as well is when you have users from different application spaces, the I.O. profile of that different application could be completely different from the, the user that's sitting beside you on the cloud. So we want to ensure that the application that the end user is using is sitting on an appropriate tier to ensure that the performance profile is matched to that application profile. So taking a few here between the Hadoop, SQL, and MongoDB, and the Hadoop is well understood that it's uh, fairly low IOPS and high bandwidth. So that can sit on a, uh, a much lower tier. If you look at SQL databases or general kind of uh, IO intensive applications, they can go sit on our flash tier or pretty cross point tier. And likewise, applications with mixed profiles can sit on different tiers as well. Um, so, design for research.
research environment. So within the um, product we have, we've actually integrated HPC, um, deep, deep learning, and big data, and the self-service research portal all under the kind of one roof. Um, and that's how we kind of envisage future HPC systems working. We've also got this capability to go and push out into our public infrastructure as well. So this is, we're doing some quite interesting work with some of the universities in the UK, where we're actually taking some you know, loosely coupled sequential workloads and farming them out to our, our cloud environments. And that then frees up cycles on the more expensive internal HPC system to run the larger, you know, tightly coupled MPI jobs and, and, and scale them so that we, we, we have a, kind of a nicer balance of, of uh, accessibility within the, the more expensive system. Um, I'll skip briefly over these as I know I'm approaching the end of my time, but all of the, there's demos essentially on the, the vSCALAR website, so you can spin up full clusters to take open HPC and Lustre, but then a few clicks on our interface, you can spin up a, a full cluster with workload manager, compilers, max libraries, workload manager, all pre-installed and ready, so it kind of eliminates the administrative burden of spinning up and configuring these clusters. Um, again, we've applied a lot of the optimization techniques that we spoke about earlier. Um, we're also enabling kind of a HPC application repository for users to just check a box and the additional applications get installed and configured to the use. So there's very little in terms of actually nothing in terms of administrative efforts to, to get an HPC cluster spun up and running. Same sort of um, approach with the big data side. So a number of my uh, staff are actually contributing in towards the Sahara project within OpenStack and, and we've actually leveraged um, a lot of the capabilities within that to deploy our HPC capability. But again, should you want anything on Spark, Cloudera, Hortonworks, Map4, um, all enabled within the product and can be spun up in a matter of minutes. And the same applies then to deep learning. So we've actually done a lot of work around GPU acceleration within the cloud. So we're passing through GPUs um, within our product so that we get as much performance as possible within these environments. And then we can run with or without containers as well, depending on how your application is it's packaged. Uh, sales stuff, sales stuff, <laughs> skip. Okay, real world use cases. So um, one of the universities we're working with in the UK is an existing customer of ours with an HPC cluster in-house, and they kind of came to us with this problem where they just wanted to offset the uh, new users that come in every year. They start running stuff on the cluster and they ruin it for everyone. They break things, they do silly things, and this, that, and the other. So they wanted kind of a contained environment to do training and evaluation for new researchers while they got familiar with you know, utilizing HPC systems. So we built a burst capability into that platform that allowed them to go and spin up a very similar type of environment in our cloud and they could just push out workloads onto that. So if they were just doing um, training courses or if they were kind of undergraduates or just starting out running applications, they could farm that workload out into our cloud and it was the same environment as it was internally, meaning that once they were at a stage of competency, they were able to bring everything back in-house and then go run it at scale under system. Um, and again, we saw a lot of the loosely coupled workloads that were farmed out to the system as well, and it freed up cycles then for you know, perhaps larger research to be, to be done um, within there. The phase two now is actually going to start uploading a lot of the application developers. So they've got a mix of people that are developing their algorithms on desktops and trying to do it on the, the cluster as well. And when people are trying to do interactive development, you, know, you optimize the algorithm, you run it slowly, you wait in a queue for execution, it six hours there, so we don't actually see what happens. So again, giving developers this environment which is identical to an internal system was another interesting use case um, for, for this particular cluster. We've also been working with um, uh, an organization who have been putting kind of a science and the service offering around genomics. Um, so this was uh, an area where the group that we were working with were developing a lot of capabilities around genomics research and they wanted to enable a collaboration platform with smaller um, local SMEs to co-develop and collaborate with them in terms of bringing the research that they were working on to market. So they've actually developed a, a hybrid VMware and OpenStack platform um, that allows them to integrate some of their own legacy cloud environments, but as well as that provision um, newer kind of OpenStack capability alongside one another as well. So it's an interesting use case in terms of being able to not just use one individual cloud provider whose technologies that will actually orchestrate between underlying clouds and depending on the, you know, the specific features or functionality you're after, VMware is good at HA and ensuring stuff is up the whole time. OpenStack can be very, very cost effective and if you built in your HA into the application using HitsMaker or ColoSync, you can alleviate uh, those HA capabilities. So again, it kind of puts the power back in the hands of the end user and uh, allows them to select the, the platform that they are most interested in. Um, and, and 
another customer of ours has actually put in our private cloud appliance and they've been actually using that for research and data analytics using uh, Map 4. But as they integrated it into the university, some of the researchers and professors were made aware that this facility was available and they wanted to start using that as part of some of the cloud courses that they were delivering. So they quickly realized that when they started to spin up, you know, 60 or 100 additional VMs on top of there to do whatever they were doing as part of their cloud academic course, that, that was overloading some of their existing systems. So with the, the hybrid integration that we had, they were able to offload a lot of the uh, training material into our public cloud and uh, keep the internal system for continuing to do their research. But this was all done on an open site. There was no existing APC system there. Um, another one um, that I've worked with in my previous uh, role was uh, CERN. I think these are one of the largest, perhaps, uh, research sites um, within Europe that are kind of aggressively adopted OpenStack, so they've more than 200,000 cores and 7,000 systems in terms of their OpenStack deployments. Um, and these are one of the kind of um, spearheaded organizations that have taken on this um, OpenStack project and really you know, use it within, use it in anger as, uh, as part of their IT deliveries. But 90% uh, but of CERN's compute resources are now delivered on, on top of OpenStack. And finally, just some other interesting projects that are kind of underway as well. So, um, Cambridge and the square kilometre array, they've been you know, testing and evaluating open with the deployment mechanism for that. The infrastructure kind of comes online later on. Pittsburgh and Monash, you know, all very, very interesting use cases where they've taken open stack and applied it to scientific computing and seen you know, very uh, favourable results as a, as a result of those. So I think that's my time up at this stage. Thank you all for attending and your participation. If there's any questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer them.